Welcome back to season two of the Adventures in CRE audio series. Today, we're talking about the birth of a building. Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. All right, welcome back to the uh, audio series. You guys, we're really excited because we again have guest Ben Stevens with us. Ben, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, we're really excited. Uh, our last conversation was so good, very interesting, a lot of great <laughs> stories. And so, you know, you were gracious enough to come back. And so today, I think we're just going to kind of continue off. Uh, in studio, we have Ron Rohde, Spencer Burton, Michael Belasco, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Spencer, real quick to kind of kick us off and uh, help us maybe pick up where we left off on the last episode. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I asked Ben to speak uh, to this topic because it, it something happened to me. Um, he shared his book early on in, in the process as he was writing it. Um, his book is entitled The Birth of a Building. And when I had... When I was transitioning from the residential side of the world to uh, the commercial institutional side of the world, uh, I went back to, to school. And, and prior to, uh, to starting business school, uh, our program suggested we read this book called The Real Estate Game. It's written by William Porview, who's what, a professor at Harvard or has been in the past. I, don't, I haven't followed his, his story. But um, what, was, what was great about that book is it simplified complex real estate um, concepts in such a way that, that someone who was new to that area of real estate could, could grasp uh, those concepts. And the real estate game is more around the investment uh, in real estate. And so uh, it would be an acquisition or value add type investment. And so when Ben shared his book, and I had a chance to read through it, it was almost synonymous with the real estate game, but for development. Uh, he does, he, he, first off, he's, he's a phenomenal writer and he, he does such a good job of taking these complex concepts uh, and, and crafting it in such a way and with stories that, that help you understand the real estate process. Even if you're completely new, you, you, you walk in, you, you don't know anything about real estate development and, and from finance through the engineering aspects, through the design aspects, through the entitlement aspects and the leasing, all, all that he he crafts in a way that is really understand, uh, really easy to understand. And yet for someone like me, who I've been in this now for, for a lot of years, and I came from the development side of the business prior to transitioning to the commercial institutional side, I learned new things. Um, and so uh, it, it, I'm not getting a fine. There's no financial incentive for me to say this other than <laughs> it, it's a great book. And so I wanted to talk, talk to Ben uh, about his book. So I guess my first question for you, Ben, before we get into um, sure. uh, the, the book itself, like what, what, what was the genesis for even writing it? Um, yeah. like I'm, most of us aren't, you know, three, five, 10 years into our career go, oh, you know, I'm going to write a book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like something sure. to do. Yeah. sounds like a fun thing right. to do on, on, on our week. So yeah, would, answer that first question and then we'll get into the book itself. Well, first of all, I'm flattered by your description of it. And I feel like I should probably just leave it at that. I can only lower expectations. <laughs> you, but, um, See you next so time. So <laughs> when, when, when I was getting into development, I was coming from a different career. And I looked seriously at architecture, looked seriously at urban planning. And I had, it, I would say, uh, an, an, an almost equal interest in those fields. I decided to get in development just because I thought I might have a better chance of actualizing some of my urban planning and architectural interests if I was a developer. But Nonetheless, when I got to school, um, kind of missed out on having not gone into those other subjects. I enjoyed what I was doing, but I knew that there were other things. And, you know, we all get siloed. And yep. it, occurred, it occurred to me maybe a year into school that there were people who were doing these internships, uh, managing and analyzing $100 million portfolios who couldn't fasten a piece of drywall to studs, you know, um, and just didn't, you know, everybody picks their, picks their little piece of the pie. So um, toward the end of my MBA, I was in the real estate club, so on, and uh, I put together an event called the birth of a building. And I, inv I invited the chief, the head of urban planning. This was in Madison, Wisconsin, the head of urban planning, Heather Souter, um, a guy from Findorf, who's a contractor, 
a uh, an architect who I knew uh, and respected, and then myself, I had been involved in a project. And so each of us took about 15 minutes to talk about our role in this process, but from totally different perspectives, right? You would, in, in some senses, you say, how is this the same project? Because each of us is looking at it in such a different way. But I came away from that event, which was toward the end of my MBA, just thinking that, man, this was really exciting. Maybe it's not, you know, how, how any one person's day to day is, you know, eventually you specialize and that's, that's the way that it is. But for educational purposes, how much better to start out with something more interdisciplinary like this to understand the whole process before you get into a specialization. So that, that's kind of where the idea for the book came from was that event, which was called the birth of a building. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it, and, and Michael, can relate to this. So we uh, were uh, students at the Baker program in real estate at Cornell. And uh, the Baker program is administered duly by uh, the College of Architect Architecture, Art, and Planning right. and by the S.C. Johnson College of Business under the hotel school. And right. one is business, right? Uh, very analytical. Uh, if a deal doesn't pencil, it's not a deal worth doing. And the other right. was very... Um, <laughs> soft, uh, theoretical. It was design. about it's design. Left right it left yeah, right it, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the numbers don't matter if, if, if it's not the right building for the space. Mm -hmm. and, and we would be in classes with um, our colleagues who were studying, you know, non, non real estate uh, related, uh, maybe they were in um, uh, uh, planning or architecture. And there, were, there was always a, a subtle conflict in those oh, yeah. classrooms, uh, uh, the professors, right? And so um, <laughs> what you're doing with this book, I think is really important. It's, it's helping the various stakeholders to a deal understand the role that the other stakeholders to the deal play and how important each is to, to that process. So, so what, you know, walk us through the book in, in 90 seconds. Uh, where do you start? Uh, right. What happens in the middle and where do you end up? So I start with this, uh, with this analogy, I start with my son's birth and it was, um, it was a rough go. We were living overseas and there's a lot of different people involved and you don't kind of know what decision, uh, to make or who to trust. Uh, but it was worth it in the end. And, um, I had a great return on him. So part <laughs> one, <laughs> well, it, 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 it's that's just right. starting. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's right. how old is your son now, Ben? He's five. Okay. He's five. So yeah, you have so, another 95 right. years of returns on him. <clears throat> that's right. That's right. So part one of the book is the birds and the bees. Why do people make buildings in the first place? And, you know, as you alluded to, um, I think the hardest thing in education is starting in chapter one. And, and realizing what people don't know. And I obviously experienced that coming into business school, having been in, you know, the nonprofit world, totally unrelated to real estate. So I was just trying to remember what did I not understand and what were the epiphanies I had that were the most counterintuitive. And I tried to, you know, just kind of take this infinity pool approach where I'm assuming you don't know anything about real estate or business or why business people do what they do, because that's what I was, that was my situation. So part one is basically in a developer's head, thinking about, you know, a building has to generate return. It can do more than that, but if not, you're going into default. So return, the real estate cycle, the nature of capital, how you, uh, you know, value a project and, and so on. Um, and then part two is pregnancy and delivery. So once you know why you're creating a building and, and whether this is a good building to create, um, then you have to, to get into the weeds of uh, doing a specific uh, model or, or looking at the asset class in particular that you want to do, uh, acquiring land, you have to get a design, uh, you have to take it through city approvals, form legal entities to shield yourself, secure the different forms of financing, construct it. You know, usually people think, of people who aren't in the industry equate construction with development and construction is its own, you know, universe. Oh, it's a, sure. it's a huge undertaking, but really in some senses, and I don't know, Michael, I don't know what your thoughts on this, but once construction starts, and of course, especially once we're, once we get returned to grade, it's like, okay, you know, this is, this is basically over. Yep. Um, so, uh, and then finally we talk about, you know, lease up and, and, and day one and a number of different, um, different appendices, but that's, so we walk through, you know, there's a short intro to architecture, a short intro to urban planning, 
intro to law, intro to financing, construction, and so on. So I'm sure you've had the conversation when you tell people that are vaguely familiar in the industry that you're a developer. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so are you putting developer. on the, you're putting on the, the hard hat and you got your tool belt on and you're out there. Right. <laughs> you know, you're right. I mean, I totally get that. They, they, there's a, there's a big disconnect and you're right. It's, it's, you know, once you get it, you know, through entitlements and once, you know, grounds broken, you're, you're, you're still involved. You're, you still have to kind of oversee stuff, but you, you have a lot more bandwidth at that time. Right. So, so, so as you, as you were writing the book, um, what did you learn? Right. I, well, yeah, a lot, a lot of times yeah. when you undertake these sort of exercises, uh, the, the, the person who learns the most yeah, yeah, is, is the one. Right. right. Now, right. Yeah. So what, 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 just one thing off the top of your head, Ben, uh, that, that you learned uh, from writing the book. Um, I would say, uh, I don't know if it's one thing, but it's kind of a macro concept. As, as I started writing, for example, the approvals section, and for each of these sections, I had one or two different people. So I had two, I had an urban planner and a transit planner who basically helped me with the approvals section. I had several fantastic architects help me with the design section and so on, capital markets people and the finance. And I guess the thing that I took away you know, you, you think you understand how complicated somebody else's job is, Yeah. but when you start explaining it, uh, it's, it was quite humbling, you know, and in some sense it leaves you terrified, like, shoot, I'm putting this book out there. Did I get it right? You know, and I think in the final, I mean, I edited it for almost a year. So I think in the final analysis, it, it, it did, you know, get to where it needed to be, but, um, it's very humbling. Uh, and, and in particular, um, made me think a lot about the predicament developers are in when, you know, we have to be rather confident that things are moving forward and kind of get momentum. But in the process, we put things in motion. We have architects doing drawings, which may never be built. We have contractors spending days or weeks pricing schemes that for projects that may not be feasible. And I would say it made the amount of effort that they have to expend more real to me and therefore I think in my mind raised the bar on how careful and how diligent I need to be in understanding the workflow that I can do to get the most projects that work while burning as few bridges or wasting as little of other professionals time as possible. I guess it, it really brought home to me how much everyone else is doing in the process. It's that perspective, you know, it's interesting because anything you do in life it's, it's easy to only see things through your eyes, but when you work that diligently on something, it sounds like this was a labor of love to an extent uh, right. and scary too, I'm guessing. I mean, put, like you said, I w you, you waiting a year, uh, putting it out there that, Hey, this is what it is. Opens yourself up to people saying, no, that's not right. Or their point sure. of view. Cause yeah. everybody wants, everybody's a critic, you know, but right. I think just right. your overall experience of, you know, being able to gain a new perspective. And then as you do this in the future, I, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about that. As you work with people in the future, not only will you be able to see it from their perspective, but has that, have, have you done that already? How has that served you? Are you able to now deal with those people in a, you know, in a more productive manner? Oh, I think so. I mean, uh, I won't, I won't get into what I call my spec feasibility workflow, which is kind of what I developed in the, in the aftermath of that. But, um, I, I actually do so. want to get into that, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but I'll let you finish. But that, that, that okay. was, uh, that's intriguing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but I think, um, I think it at least helped me understand where the pressure points are. So to take the example of design, I worked for a very long time trying to understand, like, obviously you get in the room maybe with the design team and gosh, you're just speaking a different language um, and have different perspectives. How do you get on the same page? And so in all those situations, and I've spent a lot of time in, in other cultures, and so kind of looking at it as a foreign culture, saying, is there some thread that we agree on, but we just then diverge from it in different ways? So in design, I basically came to the conclusion that all architects and developers agree with this thesis. The feelings that great spaces develop are so valuable, people will pay a lot for them. And I think basically everybody agrees on that, yeah. uh, but we take different perspectives. So architects 
are trying to understand the triggers. What triggers those great feelings? How do I maximize it? That's their job. Mm. And so the payments and the revenue, that's downstream. But for a developer, the payment and the revenue is is the main event. Right. And so if there's some great uncertainty about what feeling this project and design is going to generate, we, we probably can't afford to take the risk. And so if once you realize, okay, this is the home base that we can come back to. I just looked at different ways that throughout history, people have come back to that home base and found solutions by focusing on what everybody agreed on, which probably wouldn't have occurred to them if they hadn't established some kind of a home base, like we all agree on this. So when conflict or disagreement, let's come back to the central thesis and hammer it out using this common language, this common lens that we share. So those are the things I think that I, that I draw upon the most. It's, it's like this balance, this marriage between the subjective and the objective. You right. know? Yeah. And people, uh, you know, they buy, they make a buying decision based on emotional reasons only. And Absolutely. then they justify that with logic. So, I mean, the reality is, is one's not right and one's not wrong. It is That's, a perfect balance between the right. subjective exactly. and the objective. Right. Which and is, I, did, I, I tried hard not to result, you know, it's attention for a reason. Uh, you know, to go back to the last episode, you know, should the government be involved or should it not be involved? There's excellent arguments for both because there's things that can go wrong either way. And it's the, and it's the same in this. So I, I try to be careful not to offer the definitive answer, but at least to point out where the tension lies, you know, so hopefully that facilitates conversation. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting is the, the human brain is kind of wired to when, when you, when you see things only from your perspective, you have a duality, meaning good or bad. It's very hard for a person to fall inside the middle. It's right? super hard. And, but, but I think, again, maybe just repetition is how we learn, right? So I, I think what I'm hearing and what is super insightful is just being able to not choose a definitive side and understand the value of everybody's contribution is really, I mean, a keystone to productivity and to making the thing happen to making the end result actually you know and yeah. the end result better than it otherwise would have been had there right. not been that tension right right and and uh, i look at ron and oftentimes we get frustrated with with the <laughs> the, the roadblocks that our our uh, legal advisors seem to put in our way but when you when you get to the end of it uh those roadblocks make for a better transaction Right, and, and, and it's the same in development where uh, from the developer's perspective, maybe the architect's putting roadblocks in our way um, either uh, because that individual feels like it needs some element and, and from the developer side, we go, it's not worth the money. We're not going to get paid for that. Yeah. But when there's that tension and you find something in the middle that, that works for both, you end up with a better result than you other, otherwise would have well, had. Well, and, and again, from so Ron is in the ne negotiating of contracts and, and things like feasibility, things like that. We're talking about architecture. We're talking about what's, what's interesting about this is a lot of times we get frustrated. Okay, that's the feeling that we get. Like, Ron, do you guys ever feel frustrated in your transactions, in your deals? <laughs> Every day. Right? <laughs> so, like, that frustration is, is, like symptomatic of a transaction. Okay. Yeah. And I think most people let that frustration lead to stress, more frustration. But when I, for me, I had this thought, I'm like, you know what, if you really just sit down and you replace the frustration with fascination, then what it will do is just rework the entire way you think about what it is, assuming the person on the other end of the table, I mean, we were talking about this in our episode with you, Ron, is just um, there are certain personalities that they just don't want to get a, get a deal done, right? But assuming that they do, instead of, you know, being, you know, the, uh, what is it, the uh, bowl in the China house, what's that phrase? Bowl in the China shop. Yeah, bowl in the China shop. Instead of going and having that be your mentality, just be more inclusive, be more, you know, have a, a, a better perspective. So that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. So to continue this conversation, uh, Ben's just a great storyteller. Um, and, yeah. and he's got several stories in the book that, that are really fascinating. 
on our previous episode, he told a couple of stories that had all of us just enjoying it. Uh, as you look, think about your book, and I don't mean to put you on the spot again. Uh, sure. Is there a story in your book that that rings, um, uh, you know, that was especially impactful for you, or, or that you think is is one that you, you know, it's just a great story uh, that that you'd be willing to share with us? Um, I I like you know I I really struggled with the conclusion um, because. Well, so I, I struggled with the conclusion in a couple of ways. Number one, I didn't know how far to get into the operations of the building. Yeah. Uh, with due respect to asset managers, it, that's its own science, you know? Um, so I have a story. Maybe I'll share the story about that. And then I really struggled with uh, the conclusion. But here, let me, uh, I think I've got it right here. So here's, this is, this is called Just Beginning. It's the last normal chapter before the conclusion. So I say, I was born on a snowy day in Tennessee. A few minutes after I was delivered, a couple of nurses took me to a neighboring room to do initial diagnostics and get me cleaned up. My dad followed us out, leaving the doctor with my mom. As the doctor walked over to wash his hands and make his exit, my mom let out a sigh of relief. Thank goodness it's over, she said. As he dried off his hands and walked toward the door, the doctor shook his head and started laughing. No, Mrs. Stevens, it's just beginning. Yeah. <laughs> it is just so you know that idea that you know um, that this is going to be a longer process. But um, more more importantly, in the conclusion of the book, you know, real estate books have a certain genre, right? They have a certain tone. Yeah. A lot of times, it's kind of this rah rah, you know, with zero down, you can yeah. make you know be a millionaire in real estate. Yeah, that's you know, the- <laughs> by the time your kids start school in the fall, you'll be you know counting your millions. Right, and and so uh, obviously I, I haven't made those millions, and and even if I had, that wouldn't have been the tone of the book. Yeah. But um, I so there was there was a, a project that I was let's I won't get into how I was involved with it, but I knew the details of the project quite well, and it was rather early in my um, development career, which has not been very long ago. And the project, you know, was a hip neighborhood. Architects did a nice job. And I remember being at the opening party, there's photographers, and it's just like, you know, it's the baby's born and everybody's really excited. And you don't, you don't often go in a brand new building that no one has ever lived in or worked in. And I remember hearing somebody say like, man, I'm in the wrong business. You know, it was just like glory. Everything oh. was great. <laughs> and as I mentioned in the book, I was one of four people at that event who knew that this was a disastrous investment. I mean, the location was great. The design was great. And from the outside, everything was just like, man, I got to get into this. But as a way to earn a return, it was going to be worse than a flop, you know, and you can't undo that. So, you know, my son's life, uh, obviously he has certain predispositions, uh, some of many of which for me. So we'll see how those, uh, whether those are in his favor or not, but he has this wide open story story ahead of him and can go a bunch of different directions. And, um, I kind of contrast that That's kind of the final note of the book. I contrast that like a building is not necessarily that way, at least for the first owner, because once you lock in some of these relationships, you know, revenue expenses, cost financing, that building is going to perform in a certain way. And, you know, the rents aren't going to double just because you underestimated OPEX or the you know, the financing cost isn't going to go down just because the budget got bigger than you thought. So I try to end it just on a note that, you know, deal with caution here. It's not to say that this is not a great business. It is a great business and it's very exciting, but it's very risky too. And so um, I wanted people to, to take that message and get involved and look for a project and all those things, but just have a healthy, healthy, you know, respect for what can happen as well. And I think that I think that ultimately makes you lean even more on the people that we were talking about before, those partners that you have, other developers, sites like Adventures in CRE, because it's not something that you want to do on your own or without having you know, researched it as much as you possibly can. Wow. Well, this has been absolutely insightful. Uh, just kind of in parting, so Ben, if anybody wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? Uh, well, so I think I have a contact forum on, uh, on the skyline forum, or you can check me out on my LinkedIn, uh, Ben Stevens. Um, maybe we can put a link to that. Uh, yeah. I have a, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to include a link, uh, to, to the book, to the book and, yeah. and to get a hold of Ben if they'd like on, uh, on, 
you know, the in the in the description of this episode yeah. as well as on our website. Perfect. Great. And you can be found on LinkedIn. I can. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for being with us here today. And you guys, thank you for listening. And we will see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step, case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. To see if the Accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com accelerator.